you like to drive around and talk about the latest happenings, this is the channel you need. So subscribe and follow Carmentary. Mmm, <clears throat> good coffee. Always need to have good coffee when you're driving in your car. If you don't drink coffee, maybe you like a good tea. Whatever it is, make sure it's good. All right, welcome back to Carpentry. Time for another episode. Today's episode is going to be referring back to the prior English episode where I asked the question, "What is Japan doing wrong?" relating to tourism. So this was kind of a it's a theme I talk about occasionally, and this was a well-received episode. I got many comments. I received many comments, and some of them were really funny. Some of them were really serious. Uh, they were all good. I read all of them. Uh, I think I replied to everybody. I appreciate everybody taking the time to write in their heartfelt comments. And today I was going to read a couple of them, and then we can kind of hash out some of the stuff that people mentioned and see where that gets us. Uh, so, all in all, uh, I think people had really, you know, everybody was on point, had good opinions. One thing I, I did get, uh, I harped on the bad breakfast, or what I consider to be a uh, not such a great breakfast quality at most hotels in Japan, especially where it's like a buffet style, where you go down and they got all these things. So obviously, the really cheap business hotels, it's gonna be really crappy. But even some of the more expensive kind of resort hotels that you see at uh, ski resorts now, I think the, the quality of the breakfast buffet is not up to the international standard. And yet they're trying to bring in a lot of international guests. Now, some people called me out on that and uh, said they thought the breakfast was actually quite good. And it's funny because just after, uh, like a week after I did that episode, I went to Asahidake in central Hokkaido and I stayed at a hotel called Bear Monte. I believe it is, I've never stayed there before. And the breakfast buffet was actually pretty good. So there I am like eating, and I had complained about the runny egg problem. And I think still in general, scrambled eggs uh, at the breakfast buffet are usually in a liquid form in Japan. But at this hotel, Bear Monte, they served, uh, what is it called? Uh, Goya Champo, which is an Okinawa dish, which is made usually with eggs and tofu and the Goya vegetable, which is a very bitter vegetable, but very delicious. I love that vegetable. And there was no tofu in it, but they served it was like scrambled eggs with the Goya in it. And they were not runny. They were like properly scrambled. And I was like, wow, here I am complaining to everybody about the quality of breakfast. And suddenly, I go to this hotel and it's actually really good. The other stuff they served was actually quite good. So yeah, maybe things are improving. Breakfasts are coming around. Uh, I hope that's the case and things are improving. So I appreciate the comments on that. Obviously everybody has you know their own opinion on foods and you know, I haven't been to every hotel in Japan. But just my experience over the last 20, Eight years. It's been 28 years now, by the way, that I've been residing in Japan. It's a long time. Since 1991, uh, originally from San Diego, California, I moved to Hokkaido in 1991, and I've been living here ever since. Just a little side note for those of you who are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Uh, okay, now, I want to read a couple of these comments. I'm going to need to find a place to park real quick because I can't hold my cell phone in my hand that's illegal all right here's a quick place to stop this will be great I'll read a comment and then we'll continue driving see what a law-abiding citizen I am all right so here's a here's a great comment lived in Japan for close to five years and visit almost annually now overall the tourist experience is tremendous in my opinion it is safe clean and exciting and the locals are almost always interested in taking good care of their guests. The areas that need improvement are tough because they are very much a part of life in Japan in general. The first issue is that outside of major hotels and major tourist areas, the overall spoken English proficiency is low compared to other countries. Yes, this is a problem. Japan is trying to deal with this in a slow manner. 
Uh, where was I? I know Japan is making an effort in this area, but if tourism is as big a priority as you mentioned, a bigger focus on developing better spoken English proficiency is important. The second thing I constantly notice is what Mark M calls dealing with things that are off script. Yes, this was another comment, and that was a, a really good comment. Japan has trouble dealing with things that are off script. Through customer service standards are sky high, it can be very difficult for frontline employees at hotels, restaurants, and stores to make common sense decisions that could greatly enhance the overall customer experience. This comment is great. So well written. I used, I am used to this, so my expen expectations in this area are low. However, if you are not familiar with how things work in Japan, it can come as a shock that seemingly simple requests like crispy bacon cannot be honored. <laughs> uh, my classic example was how often I was denied barbecue sauce at McDonald's for my French fries. I was told that it was only on offer to customers ordering McNuggets. The irony here is that smaller sole proprietor businesses will commonly go way out of their way to make sure their guests are taken care of. And I know that the desire to make guests happy is genuine. If there were some way to empower the entry-level frontline staff at larger businesses to be more flexible, I think it would go a long way. Wow, that's a wicked comment. So well written. Your English skills are mighty high. I, I, am, in, I am in envy. Uh, Pat Dwyer, thanks for the comment. That was great. Uh, okay, let's uh, continue driving and talk about that. So, yeah, big problem in Japan. For those of you who have never been here, uh, it's one of those things like it, it really goes back it goes so deep and I, I've learned this now by having children of my own and raising them here in Japan I think every country you know the ultimate influence is your education system your parenting and your your home life all that obviously huge influence but kids you, you know when you're small and impressible you're like a sponge soaking everything up you spend a huge amount of time outside the home in first like a kindergarten or preschool and then elementary, middle school, high school, college, the whole, the whole works. So huge influence from the education system. And people, have, I'm not the one who came up with this by any means. People have been saying it and I've been hearing it for years that, you know, globally education systems have so many problems to work out. But Japan's rather rigid education system. And they've gone through several cycles. Uh, very strict education system. I don't know when it happened. Maybe it was in like the, the 80s or like the 90s, I think. They called it Yutori Kyoiku, which is like relaxed education. And they, they took a big change to be more mellow. Like kids used to have to go to school six days a week, right? You had school on Saturdays. That got canceled, so it's now five days a week. And it was a more, you know, relaxed sort of style of education. But it's still rather sort of by the numbers, you know. There's not a lot of flexibility. Um, there's there's just this sort of general atmosphere of like really keeping kids in order, and and you see it from like uh, kindergarten where you know all, all the kids like kind of wearing the same uniform. Everybody has to brush their teeth at the same time. They make them stand in the line to like wash their hands, and it's very orderly. And a lot of times on Facebook and. You know, on the internet, you'll see all these videos like, look how amazing Japan is, you know, all the all the trains run on time. Oh, it's just incredible. Wouldn't this be amazing? And look at the toilet, it sprays water up your butt. You know, there's, there's all these kind of like ingenious things about Japan. And obviously those things, like trains running on time, I think that comes from having that education system where things run on time. And like, when the bell rings, you gotta be in your chair, man. That's like, that's it, you know? So it's a great thing later on in life when all the trains run on time and everybody can get to work and it's really reliable and dependable. But it also really shuts down like individual creative thinking and uh, working off script, which is what that comment was about. So this is a big issue. And I guess that relates to also the English speaking ability because, um, you know, same education system. You, you got to be able to teach this, the English in the schools, create an atmosphere. You know, I, I looked uh, through snowboarding, I've met so many uh, Scandinavians, especially like Swedish and Norwegian. 
their English is incredible. Like, you, I don't know if it's everybody, but the level is so high. I was like, oh, hey, you're from California? It's like, no, I'm from Sweden. It's like, no accent. Of, apparently, I don't, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I was told by one of the Scandinavians, I believe, I believe it was a Swedish guy, like all movies, American movies, like Hollywood movies, when they play them on TV, they broadcast them in English. And they just put subtitles. Here in Japan, all foreign TV and movie shows are all overdubbed into Japanese. There's no choice. I don't, I don't, yeah. So it's little things like that. You know, culturally, you know, if they're broadcasting like Sesame Street and, uh, you know, all these Hollywood movies on TV in English and they had nothing but subtitles, you had no choice, you would kind of pick up on it, you know, over like 20 years of listening to that. I think that makes a huge difference instead of watching things overdubbed in Japanese. I have the problem, uh, even with my own daughters, who I admit I'm kind of failing on uh, getting their English ability up to, to speak. That's another topic, I'll cover that someday. Um, but like when we watch movies, they obviously want to watch them overdubbed in Japanese because they're much easier to understand. Uh, but if you started right away from the beginning, only giving them that in English, you would definitely improve things. So yeah, big issue obviously for Japan probably is going to be uh, overhauling the education system to deal with all the new technological uh, advances in the, the way the world is coming together into such a condensed unit. Great comment again, uh, and hopefully we'll find a way to get people to work more and more uh, off script, especially like you say in the big businesses. Small businesses, I run a small business myself, you are literally forced, you know, you have, someone's got you in like a headlock, and you're like forced to be flexible and please the customer, or you're not going to make any money at all. Big businesses uh, tend to be a little cocky in that way. Uh, you know, if we don't want to sell you your, the barbecue sauce, then hey, tough luck, buddy. All right, uh, I think I had a couple more good comments. I think there's another parking spot coming up here. I'm gonna pull over and try to read one or two more, and we'll cover that, and that should be today's show. I do want to comment again that I really appreciate all these comments coming in, uh, so keep them coming. Anything's okay, you know. And some people I know watch these YouTube videos, and if you're not a like a Gmail user, maybe you can't even comment on uh, on the YouTube videos. You can go to my Facebook uh, page or somewhere else and send me a comment through that as well. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, good things. Japanese breakfast, not the European version. Public transport, safety, street food, sake, beer, shopping sites, ski lifts, lift prices, rentals, and a lot of good snowboarders. All good things about Japan. That's a nice comment. Things I find hard to comprehend. Choice and prices for accommodation. Outdated ski lifts and ski patrol policies. Ooh, this is another good one. Okay, we can get into that in a minute. Um... As a resident of Japan for more than 10 years, number one, Japanese have trouble dealing with things that are off script. Ah, this is that last comment. Crispy bacon. Asking for this is like killing a firstborn. <laughs> I have had this request ang angrily refused on more than one occasion. Yeah, this is another one. Japanese breakfast, they, they tend to serve bacon and it's usually almost uncooked. It's like a very soft bacon. And, and in, uh, they, it's like they're all layered like this. Like they're not individual strips. They're like, it's like they came, they took it out of the package and they just put it on the, the heating unit and just sort of left it there on a low temperature. That's how bacon is served in Japan, in general. Yeah, I have trouble with that too. Uh, I think Japanese confuse experienced Japan tourism with experience being a Japanese person tourism. Hmm, let's read that again. I think Japanese confuse experienced Japan tourism with experience being a Japanese person tourism. Good point. People are on vacation. They don't want to suffer through language, food, service, and other problems. Unfortunately, most tourists want the comfort of home on an, in a new location. That is reality. Yeah, mm, this is true. This is true. Um, 
Okay. Get back on the road here. Yeah. Outdated ski lifts and ski patrol policies. Wow. We could go on that one for like an hour or more probably. Okay, a little history. First thing you gotta know, uh, Japan, a lot of the ski resorts, I would say a majority of them, use national forest land. Small country, Japan has a lot of national parks and a lot of national forest. It is very strictly controlled and the Environmental Protection Agency in Japan I don't know all the political details, but everything everybody has ever told me is that they're very strict or very anal in their approach to things. Understandably, they don't have a lot of forest to deal with. It's not like America. America is so huge. They are like, yeah, go drill for oil. That's okay. We got more forest over here. Japan, it's like, it's pretty limited on the number of... Uh, mountains and trees they have. So, most ski resort operations lease their land from the government. So someone comes up with a plan, says, oh, this mountain's great to make a ski resort. We want to cut down this number of trees on this aspect and make this course and put in this lift here. And they get all the paperwork done and they go out there and make the resort. What that means is they only have the rights to use the course that they built. You take one step outside of that course and that's like national forest land and that's the, the government's land or people's land, however you want to look at it. And the ski resort has nothing to do with it. So that's why up until now in Japan, you had a situation where you have all these great tree runs with all this powder, but they're all roped off and they've got nets and you're not supposed to go in there, etc, uh, etc. Et now, this has made huge changes in the last 10 years, I would say, with the influx of ski tourism from around the world. Because everybody is coming to ride that powder that's in the trees. And basically, here in Hokkaido, we saw it happen like 10 years ago uh, when the massive wave of Australian ski tourists came. And everybody just by the bus loads just started going into the trees and just like, like, you know, bulldozing a path down. And the ski patrol who had been like police catching us for years and years, suddenly were overwhelmed. And they were like, oh, screw it then. We're not gonna stop those massive people, or big people skiing, they're gonna run us over. So things changed rather quickly. And now we have this sort of gray zone where most of the, the, the powder ski resorts uh, will state, you know, that, okay, Niseko has a gate system, so they've created like these gates that you have to go through to access those areas, but they're strictly unpatrolled, out of bounds areas, the skiers have no responsibility, and they, they claim that boldly in signs and flyers and paperwork everywhere. And they do that to appease the local governments because you know obviously it's a weird it's a weird situation because everyone's promoting that powder and saying oh we got all the powder come and ski it but hey uh, we're not looking at you when you go out there and ski it you're on your own okay so that is the basic background of the situation in Japan so ski patrollers they, they they're in a they're caught between a rock and a hard place because technically the ski resorts are not allowed, uh, you know, they can only work with what's on the courses. Anytime you step out, you're on your own. And they can be quite uh, strict in enforcing that policy. Now that is, as I said, changing drastically. The old ski lift thing, uh, yeah, that's another issue. Um, some places, I, I work with a lot of ski resorts, and I've asked those questions as well. Turns out, for example, here's a good example, Niseko Hirafu, like Niseko's, the crown of Niseko. One of the most famous lifts is called the Center 4 Lift, it's a four-man chairlift, and it goes up from the bottom, it goes up over the top of this, the first sort of shoulder of the mountain, and drops you off up there. It has no hood, it's a really old lift. Um, 
the seat super hard. And obviously when you ride it, you're like, man, why isn't this thing a hooded chairlift, man? They're making so much money here. They got all these customers. They should make a new lift. Well, turns out it's a wind problem. They can't put a hood on that lift because the way they built it coming up over that shoulder, it gets like that those westerly and northwesterly winds uh, come in from Siberia. They're super strong. If they put a hood on that thing, that lift will be shut down way more. It's because it has no hood, the wind just blows through it. So you're sitting there, you're freezing your butt off, but at least you're getting up to the top of the hill and you're getting to ski down. So there's a lot of situations like that that you have to deal with, you know, it's environmental kind of situations that demand that, you know, it be a certain type of lift or a certain type of gondola. It's especially uh, a problem in Niseko where you have the really strong uh, westerly, northwesterly winds in the winter. That's what brings all the snow, but it can also shut down your gondolas and your lifts really easily. So engineering wise, it's, it's a difficult one uh, for people to put in those really expensive new lifts. And also everyone wants to save a buck. Now, I hear Hanazono in Niseko is putting in a new like, I believe it's one of those six-man uh, hooded chairlifts. Get this, with Wi-Fi and heated leather seats. Woo! Oyaka. Can't wait to ride that, man. Uh, so, I think we'll be seeing more new lift development. Now, while we're on that subject, and this will be my last point because this is getting rather long. The, uh, I have a friend who's an engineer for Nippon Cable, and that is the largest uh, cable company in Japan. Basically, they manage, sell, install, run, whatever, a huge percentage of the lifts and gondolas around Japan. And he told me, straight up, they're having a major shortage, a crisis. The people, the 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 guys who install, like you, you build a new lift, you build the towers, and then you bring all the lifts and the gondolas, but then you gotta put that wire cable around, and it comes in a big roll on these trucks, apparently, and you, you get it up there and string it around, and then it has to be joined. So it doesn't come as a whole piece, right? It's, it's one long cable. And each of the strands in that wire has to be like braided together, and welded somehow I'm sure and this is a very technical job apparently all the guys who are doing this are now like really old he said they're having a lot of trouble getting young people to learn the trade I don't know I, I was like well that's weird See, it's a cool job man and it seems like there would be like skiers and snowboarders and telemarkers and mountain people and whatever like young ones who are like you know, studied engineering or something in school and be like, hey, if I could work for Nippon Cable, I'd be out in the mountains, you know, building lifts and gondolas and all that stuff. That sounds like fun. It seems like it'd be a cool job. Just a thought. Um, so anyway, their, their engineers are aging. And if they can't get more people, they're going to have more and more trouble building the new lifts and repairing lifts. So this is definitely something that could become an issue real soon. Mm. Maybe they need a promotional video made. Mm. Finding myself work here. All right, folks, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I appreciate all the comments. Sorry I didn't get to everybody's. Uh, one other standout comment was uh, yes to the bad breakfast, or what was it? No to the bad breakfast and yes to the Scandinavian models. That was another great comment. I appreciate that one. Uh, yeah, keep the humor coming, folks, and keep the serious comments as well. I enjoy all of them. Thanks for listening always, and I'll be back with another episode. Next one, probably in Japanese. All right. <sighs> so subscribe and follow Carmentary. Oh, yeah. Drive safe.